Bicumbra. Noble Cache, because you are Pasque, Valkele, will I be Combra, Reca Pite. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to ask you to be here with us today as we conduct the business of the nation. We want to uh, ask you to give us your blessing, your guidance, wisdom, and the courage to do the right thing for our nation, Lord. And we want you also to look out for those who are having a hard time, the, the Ukrainians, the uh, Turkish people. Take care of all of your children on this on this earth, Lord. And, and uh, of course, us here, your old, the, the children, your old saints, people. We're going to ask you to uh, take care of the elders, the children, all the uh, military, first responders, all those that's taking care of all the people, Lord. So we want to uh, just, again, take care of all of our needs. You know our needs, Lord. And we want to ask you this in uh, your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Congressman. The next item on our agenda is the hearing decorum that I would like to be presented by our Clerk of Congress, Ms. Shana Rubidoux. Welcome to the Osage Nation Legislative Branch. Today is the third day of the Commerce, Gaming, and Land Committee hearing. As we prepare to begin, there are a few things to note for those in attendance. First, I'd like to introduce those present for this hearing. The Commerce, Gaming, and Land Committee members, Chair, Congresswoman Rivard, Vice Chair, Congresswoman Lemon, Congressman Hamilton, Congressman Keene, Congresswoman Stabler, Congressman Tillman, Legislative Council, Mr. Gill, Assistant Clerk of Congress and the Clerk of the Commerce, Gaming, and Land Committee, Mrs. Garcia, I myself, this is Rubidoux, the Clerk of Congress. The court reporter, Mr. Eidelman. Osage Nation Police Officer, Brian Herbert, who is serving in the capacity of Sergeant at Arms for the duration of this hearing. Others in attendance are Second Speaker Shaw, Congressman Maker, Congresswoman Redcorn, and Speaker Goodfox. Some housekeeping for today. <clears throat> The seating is limited and to stay, um, stay in compliance with the limitations set by the fire marshal. There can be no, no more than 62 people in the room at any time. This will be strictly followed and upheld. And saying that once the seating is full, no additional seats will be brought in and no one will be able to stand against the walls. The Commerce, Gaming and Land Committee will be seated at the table in the front of the room. The witness being questioned will be seated at the desk on the west side of the room. They may or may not have an attorney present with them. The documents in question are available at the desk for review when asked a question directly pertaining to them. Legislative counsel and the court reporter are seated on the east side of the room. Members of Congress in attendance who are not on the committee will be seated on the front row of the gallery with the assistant chief directly behind them. If you've not already done so, please take this time to silence your phones as any disruption could result in a request for you to leave. Please make note there is to be no food or drink in the gallery area. Also, no one will be allowed to enter the hearing area just past the front rows where the members of Congress are seated unless you have been called as a witness and are coming forward to the witness seating area. This includes any press who would like to take pictures. You must stay behind the members of Congress in the front row. Restrooms are in the bank building next door. If you need to utilize the restroom, please exit the front door and go directly next door to the bank lobby. Upon entry into the building, there will be several signs directing <coughs> you to the restrooms. <coughs> Those who have a disability and are not able to climb stairs would be asked to take the elevator to the third floor and utilize the restrooms there. Finally, this is the Commerce, Gaming and Land Committee hearing that was set after a motion was made by Congressman Keene during the December 28, 2022 committee meeting. The motion was specific in its language, stating the hearing is to investigate Gaming Enterprise Board employee expense policies and the approval of, expense, of the expenses of casino executive officers. Please note this is 
a, not a congressional hearing. It is a committee hearing that is being conducted for investigative purposes, therefore allowing the committee chair, Congresswoman Rebard, to conduct, facilitate, and oversee the hearing in accordance with the rules of the Osage Nation Congress, specifically Rule 717. Anything not addressed within the Congre rules of Congress will then revert to Robert's Rules of Order. It is important to understand that Osage law does take precedence over the congressional rules and is also taken into account. Also, please note that this is not a public hearing, which is contained in Congressional Rule 718. Therefore, there will be no public comments, opinions, or views during this hearing. There was a motion on January 9th, 2023 to allow, to authorize all Congress members to participate, including asking questions directly in the Commerce, Gaming, and Land hearing focused on casino executives expenses and the employee expense policies. This motion failed by a vote of two in favor and four opposed. The chair will recognize committee members only to ask the questions. This is consistent with the chair's ability to recognize individuals at their own discretion. As the hearing begins, the chair and the vice chair will have opening statements, then each committee member will have the opportunity to speak for two minutes prior to any witnesses being called forward. Then witnesses will be called forward one at a time. They and their legal counsel, if present, will come forward to the appropriate seat. The vice chair will administer the oath to the witness. Attorney statements of any kind will not be allowed. The witnesses will be given the opportunity to consult with their attorney at any time during the hearing. The chair will recognize committee members at her discretion to pose questions to the witness until the com committee is satisfied. At that time, the witness will be asked to remain in the building because they are still under subpoena until they are released. Then the next witness will be called. There will be a break <clears throat> for lunch and the hearing will resume at 1 p.m. For those who are speaking during this hearing, a reminder concerning the microphones and their use. It is imperative that those speaking talk directly into the microphone. They are directional, and if you turn your head away to look at someone else, the audio will be muffled on the recording and the live stream. It does not matter how loud you speak or if your voice naturally carries, the microphone must pick up the sound to be amplified for the audience, live stream, and audio recording. Lastly, I need to remind everyone that the way they conduct themselves is of the utmost importance. Unruly and disruptive behavior by anyone will not be tolerated. If this behavior occurs, there may or may not be a warning before you, you will be asked to leave, at which time the Sergeant at Arms will assist the chair and or the speaker in maintaining proper decorum in the confines of this hearing. Thank you for your time and patience. Okay, thank you, Clerk. The next item on our agenda are opening statements. Madam Chair. Mr. Gill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick reminder that we did yesterday for the record so that the uh, court reporter can get a clear record today if the committee will remember to let the witnesses finish their answers before you ask your next question. And to the witnesses, if you uh, are answering in the affirmative, please say yes, or in the negative, please say no. Please do not nod your head up and down and side to side or say uh-huh or uh-uh. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gill. I think we did a really good job yesterday, as I understand from the reporter. And so thank you, Mr. Gill, for reminding us um, of that procedure. So this morning in my opening statements, um, since today our agenda is includes the witnesses from the Gaming Enterprise Board, those current, and um, Mr. Mark Rivard, who is a prior board member. I'll just say good morning and welcome you guys here and appreciate the, uh, your at attendance. Part of the education that we've been talking about in the prior days is, is trying to clarify what, which, how many entities we have that have some oversight over our gaming operations. And yesterday we spoke to the two compliance uh, departments 
the Gaming Commission that's clearly under the executive branch. And then we spoke to Mr. O'Brien, who is the director over the compliance department within our gaming operations. Mr. Hager, do you have a question? Okay. Thank you. So with that, and because of the importance of our gaming dollars being the only funding, the majority of the funding that we receive that help fund our government so that we can then take those dollars and get those back out to the people through direct services and other services that we provide, education, burial assistance, crisis assistance. We can go on and on. Um, we actually help with those dollars to employ people within our government that literally help create an economic, I guess, a, a foundation within Pahuska, Hominy, and, and Gray Horse, Skytook, and different areas because of those dollars that are paid to our employees, that it helps develop that economic stream of growth within our communities. So years ago, as you all know in this room, you know, Congress has the authority to establish a gaming enterprise board. And only the, the only only this branch has the authority to establish a board. And so that's taken place. As you know, Kahika has the authority to appoint people to that board, and then Congress has the authority to confirm. So we've been mentioning the Osage Gaming Law. I think in our seats here, we, we typically go straight to our Constitution. And then we look into our laws that have been codified for guidance. But gaming's a little bit different because there's so many regulations tied to it, as discussed yesterday. We have to follow regulations that are described in the IGRA, that act. And of course, we have state guidelines as it relates to our compact. And then we have our own. We have, well, of course, the mix, which is derived from, I guess you'd say, the NIGC. Then we have our own, which could be really strong, as we described yesterday, is the six and the ticks. And what we found in our discussions is that there may be an absence of oversight in those in those internal controls, which is causing us a lot of fear. We started these conversations, I believe, over a year and a half ago. We had meetings with the Gaming Enterprise Board. And unfortunately, here we are today. I think each entity is maybe seeing things through um, different eyes and we're exercising our own authorities, including the Gaming Commission, to address some concerns that we find relevant and very important. So I just want to read uh, just quickly, because this is where I have to go to to understand the authority of the Gaming Enterprise Board, which is our law. And then I'll open it up for other statements from the committee. The general authority and powers and responsibilities. The primary authority and responsibility of the board shall be to develop, supervise, control, direct, manage, oversee and operate the Osage Nation's gaming facilities and gaming related activities profitably and in compliance with the limitations stated herein and with all applicable laws of the Osage Nation and the United States pertaining to Indian gaming, including but not limited to the Osage Nation Gaming Law, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the rules and the regulations of the Osage Nation Gaming Commission, and the National Indian Gaming Commission, and in compliance with the terms and conditions contained in the Tribal State Gaming Compact between the nation 
in the state of Oklahoma. Throughout this, I guess, discussion around expenses that we sit here today and it seems as though none of the entities involved can describe, in my opinion, what is a business expense related to a personal purchase. There are policies that are set within the six that we've been discussing in great length, which is the credit card policy, the travel policy, and the country club policy. And that's what we're focused on during this hearing. So the goal is to be educated and try to come up with a solution. We've asked for a solution a year and a half ago. And here we are. So hopefully throughout this hearing and with any actions that that can be taken to help us all understand what our roles are and to better define what type of what's a personal expense and a business related expense and how we interpret that. So I'll open it up for the other committee for any statements at this time. <clears throat> Chair or Vice Chair Lemon. Um, thank you very much, um, Chair Rivard, and thank you for those words. Uh, good morning, um, everyone. Colleagues, good morning. <clears throat> I believe I said in my opening statement um, two days ago that we're all going to learn something here, and um, it just reiterates what Chair Rebard spoke about, about educating ourselves and educating everyone here in this room and um, coming to a, a solution. And ultimately, I truly feel that this committee would like to have solutions that move a little faster possibly in the sense of a guiding principle so that we can hopefully avoid this again um, I do appreciate everyone um, being here that is on the witness list today. It's not going to be an easy day. We all probably know that. There's going to be some tough questions. And um, I hope that everyone can be, can answer, you know, truthfully. And um, again, I've learned so much. And I hope that we can take a little bit of a positive tract on the sense that we're all going to learn something as Osages. And if we stay on the track of doing the best that we can for our Osage people and being able to stand up and say, I could have done a better job and I will try my best to do a better job. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Congressman King? Yeah, thank you. So I thank the board for coming. Um, we've now heard from accounting, compliance, and the commission. And when we asked just direct question, was there any oversight over the executive expenses, it's on the board. Um, it's become almost like a safe word for them. So obviously, we're glad you're here. I hope we will get some productive dialogue today. But um, it's pretty astonishing how all these other entities, they didn't regularly review these expenses. Like they didn't even look at them. They, they were just, we heard from accounting, they were just processors, um, commission. Well, now we're gonna start looking at them. So, and I think with a lot of these quick fixes, it kind of shows me that there wasn't like some bureaucratic slog or lengthy process to prevent to, that was stopping us from doing it. It was the will to do it. We've already seen changes made in December. That was not even two months ago. Good, good fixes. So I'm glad the board's here. We want to work with you guys. At the end of the day, we're all on the same team. So thank you. Anyone else? Okay. The first witness is Mr. Mark Sims. Mark, if you could come up here. <coughs> Morning, Mr. Sims. 
Can you state your name? Please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, Mr. Sims. You may have a seat. Good morning, Mr. Sims. How are you? Good morning. So the court reporter, um, he's going to ask that we speak into the microphone, and you don't have to touch this piece, but you can just pull the base closer to you. Oh, okay. And um, so that way we everyone we have a lot of listeners, um, so that helps when they can hear us. Uh, one of my first questions to you, sir, is: Does the Gaming Enterprise Board operate under bylaws? Yes. Okay, and in those bylaws. Um, is there anything language that says that the board supervises the CEO? It says supervise, but not getting down into the micromanagement of, of checking each uh, receipt as it is done in the casino. This is one of the problems that has occurred. Me being on the board for nine years, we have never looked at the casino executive's expense well the the bylaws that that i have a copy of that i believe were that you're operating under or from february 2019 i believe is that the chair shall supervise office staff uh, hired by the board unless that chair delegates that responsibility to someone else and so so correct me if I'm wrong, and thank you for your, your comments, but what we did find out or what we're seeing is that maybe the CEO doesn't have any supervision. And I think that that, in my opinion, could be reckless. And so I was wondering, since you, you've been a chair for so long, what would be that interaction with the CEO? And because I understand that it's also in the bylaws that it's up to the board to approve their employment contract. Mm -hmm. So if who does supervise the CEO if it's not the chair or the board? The board has been, um, as far as supervising, we watch all the policies, the procedures, review them. Uh, we go through uh, mixed ticks and ticks to uh, approve or whatever. Mm -hmm. We sign the checks. But uh, as far as looking at each expense of the CEO, we have never done it in these nine years. And this has probably been uh, one of the downfalls and why we're gathered here. The, um, I looked at the policies and procedures, and if we went through each a transaction, we uh, don't have no policy to say, no, this isn't right. In reality, the CEO has had carte blanche. He hasn't had no cap. And, but as far as excessive, I would say there's nothing in the policies that says excessive except uh, because there's none to compare it with. And that, and that uh, applies to each, um, each transaction. Okay, so when you say excessive, so one of the documents that comes to mind that you could reference or reconcile against would be the, the budget, the central services budget. The, uh, it didn't go over uh, the amount that was, uh, that was made in the central service budget. Okay. Committee, Congresswoman Stabler. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Sims, do you recall any discussion in the board regarding a $39,000 reimbursement to Mr. Big Horse? A little bit. I can't, uh, I would just have to know what the question was to be able to try to answer that. It's been a long time. The question is, 
Was there any board action taken regarding a $39,000 reimbursement to Mr. Big Horse? There was no vote that I can remember. There was no vote, and yet we heard from accounting that it was all done with board approval. I don't think that's true. There was no vote, and usually the board would have to vote. Okay. So my next question was going to be who reconciled it for personal expenses, and evidently your answer to that would be? I would say that, if I remember right, um, we approved of him being in the Patriot Club, or I think the, one of the clubs. When you say personal expenses, uh, what are you referring to? There were four pages of uh, entries in the reimbursement a on a spreadsheet that equaled $39,192. Within that, there's a, there is a reference to, uh, through an email, to, that, that says that he reimbursed for personal expenses. There's also a statement in the report from the commission that says the chairman stated that, that Mr. Big Horse reimbursed the personal expenses. So you don't recall any of this discussion going on within the board? I don't remember that, but I'm, it's been a while. Okay, that's all I have at the moment. Thank you, Chair Stabler, Congressman Keene. Thank you, Mr. Sims. So I just want some clarity. Is it accurate to say that the board literally didn't see the executive expenses or you just got, you physically got them or saw them and just said they're fine. We did not see them. You just didn't see them. We, uh, we didn't see them and, and all the time that we, every time that there's been a transaction, we wouldn't have known about it and, until this time. There needs to be policies and procedures within the casino, not the board in order to address that with the board did go through some, they would have say a policy to say, you can't allow this, you can't allow this without being reversed. We do not have that. Thank you, sir. So I understand what you're saying, but what I've been noticing is like, kind of like the lower level stuff, they kind of had more tighter policies where the executive and upper level, there was literally an absence of a lot of policies like you just explained. So even Mr. Big Horse, when he was employed, he's not even like a regular employee. He's directly tied to the board. You guys enter into an employment contract. Is that correct? Correct. Surely the contract has terms of, you know, um, good faith clauses. You can't, no malfeasance, blah, blah, blah. You know, boilerplate legal language. To me, that means the board is responsible for his spending. Would you agree with that? I mean, not, let me... Let me retract and restate. The board is over the oversight because he's not like a regular employee through the HR ladder. He is directly employed with you via a contract. That would be so, but it uh, bylaws, even though it said supervise, that meant the whole board would uh, supervise it. Uh, later, I guess, Jeff Hager, chairman, yeah. he went to where we would sign, two yeah. of us would sign his, uh, his uh, the receipt, but this is just a band-aid. Yeah. The policy needs to be within the uh, casino itself because every business has got to be able to have checks and balances on what they do, including their top person. I understand. So just one last question, Sheriff, if I may. On the screen here, we have the email that we've talked a lot about. So. It's addressed to Tim Steinke from Kyle Revard on April 8, 2019. As you see, um, Kyle, as you see, Kyle says that the board approved. So do we have no documentation of any, even just like an email or something sent to Kyle that, that provides evidence that the board approved? I mean, because this is a huge payout. It's not like a... Yes, I... <laughs> Not that I recall, that I don't know if, uh, we did not vote on it. It's okay. So 
yeah, we probably should have brought more people in. But all right, thank you, sir. Chair, one follow up. Congresswoman Stabler. So, Mr. Sims, you're saying you didn't vote on it. Did you see the spreadsheets that were attached with receipts dating back that did not have receipts attached dating back to 2017? I don't recall seeing that that sheet. Okay. Congressman Hamilton. Mr. Sims, uh, you were on the gaming board for nine years. What years were you the chair? Um, for the first uh, six years, and then, and then the. Uh, Chairman uh, Rebard came on, and then after his uh, uh, leaving, then came uh, Chairman Jeff Hager. Okay. Were you the chair in 2019? Yes. Okay. On Tuesday, which my colleagues have mentioned, the CFO mentioned that he processed a reimbursement to Big Horse for such amount, thirty nine over $39,000, and he was told that he had board approval to do it. Or Byron told him that he had board approval to do it and he processed the check for 39,000, over 39,000. As the chair, how do you feel about that? That the CFO acted upon that with no board approval, but was just told? Well, it's, um, I can't too much remember that particular on that 39,000 but uh, normally, if we gave some type of bonus or something that involves money, we normally vote on it. But, you know, it, sometimes mistakes happen, and maybe we didn't. It's also been a recurring statement that the CEO didn't have any oversight. He did what he wanted. Now he's, I mean, we, he's turning in spreadsheets with numbers to the CFO and just saying, hey, the board approved this and it's getting reimbursed. He's getting, no one's checking the numbers he's putting in. No one's voting on it. No board action. This is, um, well, this is one of the things that has been pointed out. And this is why this committee is meeting like that, because when his expenses, there was no board oversight. Mr. Sims, do you recall any discussion about the Patriot Club reimbursement among the board members at all? I knew there was d discussion on it, um, but I cannot remember exactly what we did. Okay. Well, did, did you think, or the board, and I don't want you to have to speak for the rest of your, the board members, but did you think it might be important um, where the CEO is spending money on a credit card and the country clubs, did you even think about how much he was spending or it was no concern? And of course it's important, but uh, as far as the credit cards that travel, the, the club memberships, we didn't go that deep into it. That's one of the problems that the board had. Okay, Congresswoman Stabler. Mr. Sims, who do you believe is responsible for reviewing the receipts of an employee? For such as the such as the country clubs permit country clubs receipts. Who do you think is responsible for reviewing them? Well, I could say probably the board, and we failed at that job. So earlier you spoke about that, you spoke to the fact that you believe that the board's responsibility was managing the six, the ticks, and the mix. So and if we can, I'm sorry, I say something wrong? No. Um, so if you will, uh, Clerk, if you'll bring up page 12.
This is the country club policy that the, the casino works under. And it explicitly states what should be filed as a receipt and the information that should be applied to a receipt. There wasn't one receipt that we received that had this information on it in all the 1,556 pages. Where's the downfall? Is that for mass? Yes, that is your country club policy. And it gives the process of how receipts are presented, how statements are presented, and the system that it goes through. I think we had to revise that, but uh, I, don't, I didn't remember that. Okay, thank you. Trey, could you um, open the book and show Mr. Sims that page and how kind of, Mr. Sims, so the, the two binders in front of you contain the documents that the commission sent to the Congress? Congresswoman Stabler, you want to restate your question? I was just asking him if he was aware of the policy, I believe, and that it explicitly states. No, I wasn't. Okay. Congressman Keene? Under the Osage Constitution, Congress has the power to review any gaming board action. Emphasis on any. Do you think this entails Congress to see the buyout contract given to CEO Big Horse after he resigned? Do you mind restating that question? Under the Osage Constitution, the supreme law of the land, Congress has the power to review any gaming board action. Do you think this entails Congress to see the buyout contract given to CEO Big Horse after he resigned? In my personal opinion, I would say no. Can you expand on that, please? Well, it's being able to see his contract, I think it's getting into the payroll, and which really should uh, be discussed by the HR. I wouldn't want to discuss his pay or what the, what the payout would be. I feel like that would be putting me into a predicament. Thank you, and I want to emphasize that, um, again, our CEO is not through the normal HR ladder employee. Congress creates the gaming board, whereas in the Constitution, it's explicit that we have this power. So, yeah, thank you, sir. Mr. Sams, do you, when you, um review the CEO's contract, is there board action taken? Yes. Yes. Okay. Has there ever been a time where the CEO's contract was approved without board approval? Yes. Can you talk about that or explain that? During the first time when I was appointed, the, um, by the chief, and the board at that time told, uh, it thought that the chairman should be one to negotiate the contract and, uh, and the terms and whatever, and there was no board action. It was just supposed to be the chair. However, that's what I did the first time, and the second time I did the same, 
except the uh, the policy, I guess, had changed on me, and it was supposed to be board to, to approve what I uh, what I did. So I that's where. Okay, so that the uh, language described that says the board would approve or hire the CEO, that's contained in the bylaws. Yes. That are approved by the board. Okay. So when you say that a uh, contract was negotiated and executed between you and the CEO without board approval, how did that come about that did you then um take it take that contract to the board for approval the uh i took the contract to the board the very first time but there was no vote on it okay so the second time did you take it and what happened with that contract but the second time uh i took when um the board uh, decided to review it because he had been working on the contract. I t uh, they said we had to review it, which that's okay, but anyway, I turned it into the uh, rest of the board for review. And was the negotiations um, discussed in, in your in that contract that you and the CEO negotiated after you took it to the board, did they make any changes to it? Yes. Okay. Committee, Congresswoman Lemon and then Congressman Keene. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Sims. Good morning. <clears throat> when you were appointed to the board, um, the first time you were appointed, Mr. Sims, did you ever receive any board training or orientation? No, it was all learned by experience. Okay, thank you. So um, when you went to your very first board meeting as an appointed board member before you were confirmed through Congress, um, what information were you given to, to aid in your role? At that time, the board was new. I think there was a change of uh, board uh, CEO and CFO and COO. So the board was just kind of stuck out there in limbo for a while. No training, nothing to come about. Thank you. After you um, had your first meeting, um, I mean, so at your first, very first meeting that you attended, what inf what was waiting for you at your seat? Were there documents waiting for you? A board packet? And a, I think a board packet, yes. But um, if my first meeting was going with uh, Chair Heyman, and I think I was vice chair then, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, to talk with uh, CEO Neil Cornelius. And at that time, the board did not want to renew the contract. On so, your very Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. So your very first, first meeting that you attended as a new board member was to talk about, discuss a contract um, with the current CEO. Okay. I just want to clarify. So you are not given any documents to read concerning your responsibilities the bylaws, the gaming commission um, codified laws, the um, ethics law. Was was there ever any talk with anyone before your appointment or after your appointment concerning those it was documents? Probably after, but I don't know how long after. I knew I I knew the ethics law, and I know most of the the Congress laws because I sat on Congress and um, so in that part I didn't have to have too much training because I 
I had already taken it. Okay, thank you. So um, had you read the bylaws before your first meeting, the Osage Nation Gaming Enterprise bylaws? No. Were you provided a copy of those? Later. After your meeting, for very first meeting, or even later? Just later. <clears throat> so earlier, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you stated that you didn't know about what excessive spending is because it's not defined in policy. There's no cap. I believe that was a word that you used also. <clears throat> Based on the information that's in, that's in the 1,500-page report, is it your opinion that there was excessive spending? In my opinion, yes, but I wouldn't. We didn't. We wouldn't know how to correct it at that time because there was no policy policy that would say this transaction is not uh, legal or correct. We wouldn't have no way to change it because had we um, seen the excess, the spending that everybody says it's excess on that. Uh, we would st we could change the policy, but we wouldn't be able to do with anything with that transaction at that time. Would it be safe to say that you could deny approval of of that expense until the compliance, um, what until the expenditure came into compliance with the policy that was in place? At that time. I don't know if we could deny it or not uh, because it's uh, you had to base your denial on some type of policy. At least that's what I think. Mr. Sims, um, are you aware of the credit card policy, the travel policy, and the current country club policy? I have not read it. In I'm aware that, uh, that it's been changed. The uh, three policy uh, country club travel, and uh, yes, I'm uh, I'm aware of it, but uh, I haven't seen the revision. Okay, so you're aware of the current policies, how they stand. I do believe in the policies. Um, there are currently there are some guiding principles that the board should have referenced and that would have given you the ability to not approve an expense. That's just my belief. Do you feel that when you're working together like in a board setting or committee setting um, and action is taken by the body, not just by one person on, on the committee or on the board, do you feel that um, sorry I lost my train of thought <clears throat> so the policies say that personal expenses are supposed to be identified by the account holder and reimbursed to the casino did it not seem curious to you that once that not once did Byron Big Horse identify that he took a friend to play golf at the country club or entertain friends for dinner at the summit club or possibly even say, hey, Chairman Sims, I, I went to summit club for Mother's Day and bought my kids golf clubs through the country club pro shop. Did, did those conversations never happen? No, they never did. Did you hear anyone ever did you have anyone talking in rumors or, or hearsay that, that Mr. Big Horse was living a, a some would say, a lavish elite lifestyle at the expense of the Osage Nation? Not that I can recall. <clears throat> Do you believe... <clears throat> Do you currently, did you as the board chair have access to 
Mr. Big Horse's expenses? Yes, if we uh, we had we would have access, but we just didn't. And how does that access? Is it electronic access? Is it paper? I would imagine at the time I saw it, it'd probably be paper. Did everyone on the board have access, or just the chairman, vice chair, office? You know. Well, whenever we uh, we'd pull something up, it would be the will of the board. Could you repeat that, please? If we went to check on something, it would probably be the will of the board. So earlier there was a statement, um, Congresswoman Stabler asked you a question about the reimbursement um, to Mr. Big Horse uh, for somewhere around $39,000 for his Patriot Club membership and all of the um, expenses that incurred um, the receipts date back to 2000, beginning in 2017. Have, and ha have you ever known expenditures, even in your own personal business, that you would go back and reverse, reimburse two, three, four, five years in, in retroactive form? Not that can we call. <clears throat> Can I make a statement? Certainly. On uh, the travel club, the, the credit cards, as a board, we would never have received that because that was ca strictly casino. Um, I think maybe in the future, maybe these different policies would be provided. but. All the nine years I've been on, we never have went into the actual policies of the casino until there was something that came up. I think in the beginning of the report, with actually within the commission report, there's an area where the board approved those policies which you know are found in the six, but they were brought to you individually, I think, or the policies were brought individually, and there's clearly board approval. So it does show, I think if you could, Caitlin, maybe it might be page seven or eight. Yeah, there you go. Go down. So if you see this document on on page 10, this contains the system of internal control standards for the country club. And if you'll see, it was approved by the commission, but it was also approved by you, Mr. Sims, and Susan Nealon, Mar I think it's Mark Rivard and Julie Malone. Stand corrected. I don't remember that. Okay, if we can scroll did. down. There's also another indication that the board signed and approved. It looks like the credit card policy. I'm going to say when the six and takes and makes come before us. Because of the way the board is structured, we all time, whenever a policy is made, the casino sends it to the gaming commission for compliance and if they had to do anything. Then it goes back to the casino and they would make changes or not make changes. And then when it comes to the board, you pretty much know that it's in compliance because the gaming commission has already uh, said that you know they agree so the game the game the ga gaming board a lot of time does not have the amount of time that it can take to go through all this it's what being a being a gaming board once a month we're getting these uh, policies about the same time pretty close as you are and so 
we don't we don't have a whole bunch of time to go through everything once. Okay, so it looks as lo it looks as though the board has approved these policies, but yet the chair who's it's described in the bylaws shall supervise the CEO that that wasn't really happening. So back to my original point, I don't know that anyone can say that they've ever looked to see or described an expense as being personal or business related. That, that's what I'm hearing is that that didn't happen most certainly during the time you were the chair. And so um, I've got Congressman Keene that has a question, then Congresswoman Stabler, and then Congresswoman Lemon. So there's some confusion here. So Steinke went on the record, CFO Steinke. He said, so we can see these line items with the casino executive, the numbers. He's saying the board saw those and approved them already. That's why they were just processors. It's not that you guys reviewed the over, you guys approved the overall six policy. No, we're narrowing down. He, Steinke went on the record and said, the board approved these executive singular amounts down this sheet. That's why we're processing them through. Is that accurate? And we're talking about the 39,000? Well, that and just a lot of these numbers, you know, on the spreadsheet. What I'm saying is that we have the CFO saying, well, the board already approved it. We're just processing it through. But your testimony probably seven minutes ago said, you guys never looked at this stuff. I don't think on um, when we talked about it, we kind of made an agreement, but I don't know if we ever vote on it. Well, I guess I'm asking more precisely, did you ever even look at them? Did you ever see what, what we're seeing now? Where you'd have like a month summary of alcohol, golf clubs, golf shirt, blah, blah, blah. No, I didn't see that. Okay, because the CFO is saying, again, I want to emphasize this, he's saying the board approved all that. And obviously, approving means you actually do something. So I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Congresswoman Stabler. Thank you. Mr. Sims, I want to talk about the <laughs> regulations again, or the, the, the policies and procedures, the six, the ticks on that line, if you are approving documents that you have not read, then what's the purpose of the board? When it comes back to the board, the casino and the gaming commission has pretty much approved of everything. The board usually doesn't look at it and make any type of approval. I mean, uh, changes. I have never seen that, but uh, yes, we uh, we get a chance when they bring it in, we get a chance to look at it right then, and then usually we go by what they what they have already approved, both commission and the casino. So my question goes back to then what is the purpose of the board? Well, the purpose of the board is to oversee and and approve of the policies and ticks, but. Um, because of the way that we receive our uh, the books that we're supposed to do in the policies, we see them at the last moment. So it's um, that's kind of one of the the problems that we have. So the purpose of the board, really, to be honest with you, a, a gaming board like we are set up now should be different. It should actually be a, a three, maybe a three or five man board that is fully, or, uh, fully uh, to be uh, fully uh, in a, oh, it should be a gaming board that is hard to do the work and to watch over the casino. Because the board can only do so much. Well, it appears the board has just about one job, 
and that's to supervise the CEO as the bylaw state and to oversee the operation. So there are certain things such when, as these regulations when, that are primarily the most important when you're work saying, to be done. When you're saying supervise during the operation, a lot of times we don't know what's going on. And we only <laughs> appear once a month. And you're not going to be able to supervise somebody if they, whatever they do, or you won't even know about it maybe to the next board meeting. And so that, in that aspect, we would have to be there almost full time. Now, if we was there full time, we could do a, a lot better, and all this wouldn't be happening. But we're not there full time. We're there one day a month. And then we got, then we're catching up on everything. So it's, um, I think for the way it's operated, we've done tremendous because it's, uh, but unfortunately in every organization, there's going to be mistakes. And whether it's in the gaming board or the casino, I'm not saying we went through anything perfect. Yes, we made a lot of mistakes, but that's a growth in the gaming board growth in a casino and you say what good is the gaming board it's for you to answer because I haven't uh, you know we look over the most important things we did not know that this had happened it's unfortunate and what we would made you consider mistake. the most important things because you said you did look over money because that's what we've tried to do to make as much money for the tribal distribution as we can possibly do. And looking at expansion. All my businesses, the thing that runs it is money. And that's what I believe in. And for owning four to five businesses, I've done tremendous. And yes, I've made mistakes. This casino and board will make mistakes, no doubt about that. But for what the board does, it does well. It Let me real quick, Mr. Do Sims. Perfect. Would you just back away from the mic microphone just a bit? You're, there's a lot of feedback right now. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm done. Okay. I'm going to just follow up with your question, Congresswoman Stabler, and the comments from Mr. Sims. As the chair of the uh, board for so many years, I believe one of the authorities that's, that's given to a chair is on the chair of this committee is I have the ability to call a board meeting at any time. Or, you know, with notice, proper notice, that we could actually meet five times a month, maybe 10 maybe twice a week or whatever it is, but it's actually up to the chair to set the agenda for any board meeting. And um, that's how it is here with Congress, as you're well aware. Is that the same case with the Gaming Enterprise Board? Yes, we get with the casino, and should they have any problems or need something approved pretty quickly, we will call a special meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Lemon, then Congressman Keene. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Sims, so earlier <clears throat> there's been some discussion. We've talked about the $39,000, and you said there was no vote, but do you remember having some discussion about it? Is it commonplace, or was it commonplace, in your opinion and, and your experience um, from being on the board, the gaming board, that there were many issues that were discussed possibly in executive session or amongst yourselves before the meeting took place and decisions made but not ever voted on through the normal process of an open meeting session. And then therefore, um, the decisions that would come down did not have a resolution attached to them. I would say yes. Not afterwards uh, so much as trying to make a decision, but I would say there were discussions maybe in the actual executive session. And 
was this commonplace when you came to be on the board your first term? Yes, this was done during the first term that when I came on the board then did that quite a bit. When you were first on the gaming board, did you have an attorney that you could, that ever gave guidance concerning your lack of official board action? The reason I'm asking is because one can assume that decisions were made without the rest of the board's knowledge and that some people would call it rogue or that the chairman or vice chair or just a couple of folks on the board decided that this was going to be okay and just to tell the CEO, yes, that's okay, when the rest of the board didn't know about actions. That would happen one time uh, when I did the contract and I went by the first uh, boards that had appointed me. But the second time, they would, took it into the uh, their board meeting. Okay, so whenever, can we have the, is it page 12, or the email from uh, Kyle Rivard? Is, what page number is it for Mr. Sims? Page 21, Mr. Sims. Okay, so on this particular document that we're looking at, Mr. Sims, my line of questioning earlier about the having discussions amongst board members without official board action, um, and you said that this has happened in the past, that there wasn't a vote taken on it, and this email here with this document shows that on the left-hand lower side here, it says no record of official board action, which yesterday was discovered that Kimberly Pearson the COO at the time, um, that is her handwriting on the left side there. And so is this an instance where discussion occurred amongst a couple of board members or possibly in executive session that yes, we're gonna go ahead and reimburse him but no official action was taken? Among the whole board, yes. It did occur among the whole board. Was there ever times that it didn't occur among the whole board or that ever? No. Thank you. <coughs> Congressman Keen. Um, Mr. Sams, we're gonna pull up a receipt here. What page number, Caitlin? Page 425. We have that you purchased some brass coins. Are you aware of this? I didn't purchase. It happened like that. Is Byron had sponsored. Sir, a, please speak into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Byron had uh, sponsored 150 year centennial up in uh, Independence, Missouri. I think the Independence uh, Museum had asked him for sponsorship. Well, during that, they wanted a centennial coin, and and so I told him I might be able to design it. And then when I was, I was designing, I found out we didn't know who to, to, to make it. 
So I went back to uh, Margaret Bird, and she said that uh, <clears throat> she had talked with her friend, a uh, woman by the name Dixie Upton, and she had a son named Chad Lewis. So Margaret gave me the, num the name of that, and I called Byron, and Byron dealt with that directly because a board member cannot, uh, cannot authorize singly a transaction to be done. Now, how my name got like that, I'm not sure. But uh, the coin was for that, uh, that centennial up there. And uh, to show you that it wasn't for me to sell or anything like that, I brought the drawing that I made, if you would care to see it. Chair, yeah, that'd be fine, right? Sure, that's fine. So, or just one more. Okay. Um, Sorry. One other question for you, Mr. Sims. Huh? We do have it on record that CEO Big Horse was actually did actually pay back five thousand um, dollars, two hundred twenty-two dollars. Was the board ever made aware of that? On the fact, what was it for? I know he paid back. Uh, golf clubs and something about t-shirts that's the only thing i know about right then do you want to find your pages and then we'll come back to it yeah thank you go ahead okay mr sims i have a question about the event in missouri was that a casino event yes how so well i guess the uh i don't know the exact process on that, but I guess the uh, Independence Museum had uh, contacted the uh, CEO, and he had agreed to do that. The I am not ahead of that. I was just a participant. I gave a speech in the re reenactment when it first started out, and I gave a speech to uh, the Independence Museum and Jeffrey gave, uh, Standing Bear gave a speech to everybody toward the, toward the end. So was there discussion at any time about casino-related activities or anything to do with the casino? The uh, Independence Museum praised the casino because that was the 150-year celebration on the signing of the Drum Creek Treaty when uh, the Osages left Independence and came on into Oklahoma. It was a pretty big deal. Okay. Can the, would the committee entertain taking a 15 minute break until 1030? So moved. Second. Uh, Thank you. Motion in a second. All those in favor say.